Welcome back to the three months of Modal Logic, the sequel to 100 Days of Logic here with Carnades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with the final 10 days of Logic, looking at Modal Logic and God. In this video, we are going to be combining deontic, temporal, and epistemic logic that we've learned about so far with alethic modal logic and looking at how all four of these can be used to make arguments for the existence of God. We'll do a different argument for each of deontic, temporal, and epistemic logics, and in all of those arguments, there's going to be some small element of alethic modal logic present. So, let's take a look. Many arguments for the existence of God use modal logic, or one of our different modal logics, to help prove their conclusions. In this video, we're going to look at the ways that the different kinds of modal logic that we've learned about interact with alethic modal logic, and look at the way that they can be used to explain different arguments for the existence of God. Now, it's important to note, this video will not only assume an understanding of modal logic of having gone through the series, the three months of modal logic, but also a basic grasp of the arguments for the existence of God that we're going to discuss. Fortunately, I have videos on all of the arguments presented here. Feel free to pause the video to watch these supplements if necessary. Because we've outlined the full arguments elsewhere, here we're just really going to explain how the premises and objections to the arguments can be translated into logic. And if you want to do the work of using those premises to prove the arguments or using the objections to disprove the arguments, feel free to do that on your own. All right? So, first off, deontic logic and the free will defense. The free will defense, of course, is Plantinga's famous response to the problem of evil. And it talks a lot about ethics and necessity and alethic modal logic and deontic logic. So I think it's a perfect argument to highlight the interaction between deontic logic, our obligations, and the necessity of certain propositions. So to represent the free will defense, we will have need of our common sense deontic logic terms. These guys are a little bit more complicated than your standard obligation, permissibility, impermissibility, omissibility, and optionality. There's a few more terms in there. I would highly recommend you check out the video on common sense deontic logic, if only because I think that the common sense deontic logic terms actually do make more sense for what we talk about when we're talking about everyday claims about ethics. Check that out for that, but also it's going to be very helpful in understanding what we're doing here. All right? So, one of the claims made by the free will defense is that it is better to have free will than to be forced to fulfill obligations. And in fact, the best possible world has subjects which are free. Where S is a subject, P is a proposition, and FWS is S has free will, we can make these statements as follows. So the first statement says that it is part of the maximal course of action for S to have free will. For all S, it's part of the maximal course of action that S has free will. The best possible world, or the maximal course of action we can take, is one where S has free will. Note that this is kind of the maximal course of action for God in deciding what world should be created. The second one says that is it is permissibly suboptimal, permissible but not part of the maximal course of action for S to not have free will but all obligations to be fulfilled. Now, one might argue that, in fact, it's not even permissible for subjects not to have free will, but it seems to me that a world in which we are all not free, but all have lots of pleasure and all choose the good automatically and there's no evil, at least is a permissible world. But it may not be the maximal world. It's not the best. By being permissibly suboptimal, it's stating that it's less than the best possible world we could pick, which is at the very least what the free will defense is saying, that such a world is less than our maximal world. Now, the free will defense further tells us that it is impossible to have a world where people are free and all obligations are fulfilled. 
So for all subjects S and all propositions P, it's necessary that it's not the case that S has free will and if P is an obligation, then P is the case. Basically, for all subjects S, propositions P, it's necessary that it's not the case that S is free and all obligations are fulfilled. This is basically saying that for S to be truly free, that kind of libertarian free will that planning is talking about, it must be the case that S has the ability to not fulfill an obligation. That there's no way that you can create a world where S always freely chooses to fulfill all of S's obligations. Hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, check out the videos on the free will defense. Those go into it in more detail. Furthermore, the free will defense claims that if P is impossible, an omnipotent being cannot cause P. Therefore, an omnipotent being cannot cause all obligations to be fulfilled in a world with free will, where OMP, P, is an omnipotent being can do P. We have, for all propositions P, if it is necessary that not P, then it is not the case that some omnipotent being can cause P. So, we can conclude an omnipotent being cannot make all obligations fulfilled if subjects are free. From our previous premise, noting that that was not possible. Now, one might object to the free will defense by saying that natural evil is, compa is completely compatible with free will. Where N is an act of nature, one might say it's possible that for all subjects S and all acts of nature N, for S to have free will, and if N is in the maximal course of action, then N is the case. And if it's not the case that N is in the maximal course of action, N is not the case. So basically, you can have free will and all natural obligations. So all the maximal good that the world could do can be fulfilled. This is a problem for the free will defense because the only kind of evil that it can explain away is evil talking about human choice and human action. Hopefully that makes sense. As before, check out the other video if you need more information. Next up, temporal logic and the cosmological argument for the existence of God. So, in the column cosmological argument specifically, we are going to be using temporal logic. It's important to note that not all cosmological arguments are going to be using temporal logic to work, but the column cosmological argument will be. And it's based on a particular understanding of the temporal logic and our system of instance in time. For the column argument to work, time must have two of the elements of well-ordered time. So, if time is well-ordered, that means that time has a beginning, and each moment has an immediate successor, and even that there is no end. But the no end part is not going to be necessary for the column argument. If time has no beginning, then an actual infinity exists, because there's an infinite number of moments before now. And so the column argument isn't going to work. So there's no reason to believe that the universe needs to have a beginning. Similarly, if time is dense, then there is an infinity in between any two instants, an actual infinity going back between this instant and the instant just an instant ago. So even though there may be a beginning to time, it does not follow from the column argument because the column argument is saying that an actual infinity does not exist. And so if time either is dense or has no beginning, it seems that the column argument is going to fail. Note, that we don't need the third axiom of well-ordered time, which claims that time has no end. Remember that well-ordered time is kind of like time corresponding to the natural numbers. If you're curious, check out my videos on well-ordered time and the axioms of well-ordering and everything that goes into that. But basically, for the column argument to work, these two axioms need to be present in our time stream. In fact, we are committed to both of these axioms being necessary. Think about it like this. If there were any possible world where time was dense or had no beginning, then an actual infinity would be possible. And the argument is saying that an actual infinity is not possible.
possible. So if there were any possible world where these were the case, then we would have a problem. And similarly, we can realize that we can actually conclude, so long as these are axioms of the system, that they are necessary. So we can put that little necessity box out in front of both of those axioms. As I said, once these are axioms of the system, we can prove them to be necessary with our necessitation rule. Yet, since they are axioms, they cannot shown to be true. They're true only by stipulation. The only reason we hold those axioms is because we decided to. If we want to say that negative numbers or fractions do not exist in a particular system, we can't do so by argument. We must do so by assumption. We're just stipulating that we're only talking about natural numbers, or we're only talking about time instants that correspond to natural numbers. We haven't proven that time instants do in fact only correspond to actual numbers. We've just stipulated that time instants correspond to natural numbers. If we are not claiming that they are axioms of the system, so if the column argument is saying that they are offering some argument for it, then that means that they do rely on some argument, so they're not provable within the system alone. That means the necessitation rule cannot show that they are necessary, and if they're not necessary, the argument's going to fall apart, because if they're not necessary, that means that there's some possible world in which those axioms are not the case, and time goes on forever behind us, or time is dense. My intuition is that at least there's some possible world where time instants work a little bit differently than they do here, even if it's not the case that time instants do work differently here. So I think there's a lot of work for the column argument to do to prove both of these axioms are not only true for the actual world, but are necessary for all possible worlds. It's a bit of a problem. Next up the modal epistemic argument for the existence of God. So this is a less known argument, a little known argument for the existence of God. I have done a video on it and a video on some objections to it. Check out those videos for more information. It does, however, use both alethic modal logic and epistemic logic, so it's quite appropriate for this video. The simple idea behind the argument is that if the statement God does not exist cannot be known, then it must be false. For all propositions p, if p is necessarily unknowable, then p is necessarily false. This premise can be translated as the following. For all propositions p and all subjects s, if it is necessary that s does not know that p, then it is necessary that p is false. All right? Look at that. Try to wrap your mind around that for a second. Now, the proposition God does not exist is necessarily unknowable. This premise can be translated as the following. Where G is God exists for all subjects S, it is necessary that it is not the case that S knows that God does not exist. Therefore, God does not exist is necessarily false. This premise can be translated as the following. It's necessary that it's not the case that it's not the case that God, which we know through double negation, we can just turn that into is necessary that God does not or God does exist. I present a number of objections to this argument in my series on the subject. An especially interesting one is done out logically using the following statement. If you want, try to guess my objection, or just watch the video for the proof. The statement is, no one knows this statement, or n, this statement is equal to, for all s, it's not the case that s knows that n. If you haven't watched those two videos, I would highly recommend for your kind of understanding of alethic modal logic and doxastic and epistemic logic that you try to use this statement to disprove one of the premises of the argument or show that the argument is invalid. That was modal logic and God. Next up, we're going to be talking about agential deontic logic. In the next three videos leading up to the final video of our three months of modal logic, we are going to be going a little bit farther in each of our subjects. So agential deontic logic takes deontic logic a step farther, then we're going to look at a video taking temporal logic a step farther, and finally we'll look at a video taking epistemic and doxastic logic a little bit farther. 
Watch this video and more here at Carnades.org and stay skeptical, everybody.